Good evening. My name is Matthew Bullock, and I'm an associate professor of biology, integrative biology at Oklahoma State University. And this afternoon, I'm going to be telling you uh, some information about parasites in host animals with six legs. Stories on the dreadful, creepy, and amazing lives of insect parasites. So to most people, the, world, the word parasite conjures up an image of disease and pathology, blood and guts, gross disfigurement, or even death. And in fact, that is true. A million to three million people die of malaria each year. But if we think of parasitism more broadly, and we think of it from an ecological and evolutionary perspective, it has been estimated that more than 50% of all living plant and animal species are parasitic at some stage during their life cycle. Just as importantly, it has also been estimated that if we think of how many plant and animal species are parasitized, the number unquestionably approaches 100%. Now, if we take, for example, a common pond, this is one at Oklahoma State University called Theta Pond, and you walk around that pond, you commonly see common free-living animals, such as crickets, ducks swimming around, and sometimes even the occasional beaver. In fact, when all of those animals are examined for parasites, they all have very specific parasites that live in or on them. For example, on the ducks there, you can see some lice that swim through the feathers and feed on feather parts. The cricket that you're seeing here is actually releasing a horsehair worm into the water, which then completes its life cycle as a free living species. And then the beaver has these amazing little beetle parasites that live in its fur. And there's hundreds and hundreds of different free-living animals that have uh, many different types of parasites. Now, parasites are present in probably about 43% of the generally accepted 35 animal phyla, so uh, quite a bit. And it's really suggested parasitism is probably the most common way of life. Now, unlike free-living organisms in nature, Parasites are difficult to study due to their small size, complex life cycles, and general taxonomical impediments. And as a result, it is not very common to know much about their general biology compared to free-living animals and other free-living organisms. So today I would like to tell you three different stories about the dreadful, the creepy, and amazing lives of some of the insect parasites and or parasites of insects. So story number one is going to deal with the dreadful parasites. And the title of this one is Frogs and Hungry Maggots, Amphibian Myiasis and the Role of Museums in Our Understanding of Diversity of Parasites. So a little bit of an introduction on myiasis. Myiasis in amphibians is caused by larvae of flies, some of which cause substantial mortality in their amphibian host. In the Nearctic and Palearctic regions of the world, flies in the genus Lucilia have been reported as obligate or facultative parasites of amphibians, particularly of true toads. But there's very few reports of these flies causing myiasis in North America, frogs and toads. Now, in Europe, Lucilia bofornivora has been studied very well. And in fact, it even has a common name called the common toad fly. And it's a typical green bottle fly that you see commonly in your windows, except this particular species finds toads very attractive. And when the females fly around and they see a toad, they lay under, uh, they land on their back and they deposit eggs. A little bit about the life cycle. When female flies are placed among frogs and toads and salamanders, they oviposit almost exclusively on toads. Female flies deposit eggs on the surface of the amphibian skin, usually on the back, and eggs then hatch within about 24 hours or so. And then first stage larvae migrate along the toad's back until they reach the eyes, and here they enter the lacrimal ducts and migrate to the nasal cavities of their amphibian host. And here I'm going to show you some pictures of what happens next. And this is the dreadful part. So this is a healthy toad that just became infected. The maggots crawled into the lacrimal ducts, into the nasal cavities. Within 24 to 36 hours, you can actually see the maggots feeding inside of there, causing a larger wound. And then within 40 to 72 hours, they eat most of the nasal passages away and even move into the eyes and ingest the brain, kill the amphibian host, 
and then they move out into the soil where they pupate into adult flies. Now, what about Luciria species in North America? Well, two species of flies in the genus Lucilia have been reported to cause myiasis in North American amphibians. And that's Lucilia silverum, which is found in the Palearctic and Arctic region, so both in Europe and North America, and also Lucilia elongata, which is only found in North America. So what do we know about Lucilia silverum? Well, records of toad parasitism from the Palearctic region were often unreliable because of failure to distinguish between Lucilia silverum and Lucilia bufonivora. These two species of flies are very similar morphologically, and, and people that didn't pay much attention could easily confuse the two species. Few reports of amphibian parasitisms are also known from North America, and when they are known, they're usually uh, based on Lucilia silverum identification. And then in North America, there are reports of collecting this species of fly from carcasses of rats, chickens, frogs, and turtles, which suggests maybe it's not always parasitic, but can also develop in carrion. Well, during uh, my master's, while I was working at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, on amphibian parasites, I had the chance of discovering American toads with recently deposited fly eggs on their skin. And knowing about some of these fly issues, I became very excited and I brought those toads into the laboratory. And probably within six hours of bringing those toads into the lab, what I noticed is that they started using their hind legs to scratch their back, almost as if they were trying to dislodge those fly eggs that were glued to their skin. I placed those toads under a dissecting microscope, and what I discovered was that first stage larvae or maggots hatched and they were migrating under the skin of that toad, probably causing that toad some discomfort. Well, within about 24 hours, what you noticed was a swelling on the toad's back, as you can see up here, that first image. Uh, within another hour, you noticed there was an open wound that developed on that toad, and usually only one wound per amphibian that was infected. Uh, not always uh, on the head, sometimes on the back, and in this case, on the forearm. Here, the maggots all fed as a group. And eventually, within anywhere from three days to seven days of infection, the amphibian would die and the third instars continued to feed on the carcass, but did not consume it before migrating out and actively seeking a suitable area to pupate. Now, after leaving the carcass, third stage instar actively searched for a selective area to pupate, and they usually burrowed into sand or dirt that replaced those maggots on. And then third instars turned into pupae within two to three days of emerging out of the toad remains. And this is typical type of pupae. They're common in most of the common uh, well-advanced flies that we know of, uh, free living or parasitic. Now, those flies began emerging within seven to nine days of being buried as a, in a pupa stage. And then we were able to identify them using the available keys at the time as uh, Lucilia silverum. And we published a paper uh, in 2002 in the Journal of Wildlife Diseases, uh, basically describing the life cycle of this species for the first time from North America. A few years later, I was fortunate to also be working on frog parasites and discovered some metamorphous wood frogs. And when I was collecting these frogs, what we discovered that they also had eggs of flies on their back. Again, we brought those frogs into the lab those eggs hatched within hours of um, uh, collecting those frogs. And again, the maggots burrowed right into the uh, back of those frogs and fed as a group, eventually killing those wood frogs. And in fact, the only thing that was left was bones. Maggots reduced the carcass to bones within 42 to 59 hours of those eggs hatching. We were kind of excited about this observation because it suggested that the reason people always report these flies in toads was because maybe if they infect other species of amphibians, those maggots consume those frogs so quickly that you never actually see them very commonly infected in nature. <laughs> 
And in fact, we identified those flies again from those uh, frogs that we reared in the lab, and they were Lucilia silverum, again, using those keys that were available at that time. Well, fast forward to 2019, and one day I received the email from T Dr. Terry Whitworth, who's a blowfly specialist, and he wanted to inform me that in 2014, they discovered as part of looking at museum specimens of adult flies, the first record of Lucilia buffonivora from North America, and they wrote new keys to North American species of Lucilia buffonivora and other um, other flies that potentially cause myiasis. Well, he also informed me that based on molecular work in Europe, Lucilia silverum was strictly saprophagous. They basically meant it feeds on carrion or dead animals and waste. And specimens identified from Europe and neurons as L. silverum were actually Lucilia buffonivora. Okay, and this was done by another researcher uh, that contacted Terry um, to see if he could obtain some flies from North America. And so Terry wanted to know, maybe the flies that I raised in those frogs were actually Lucilia buffonivora and not Lucilia silverum. And in fact, he asked me if I still had any specimens available for my studies. And I got really excited and told Terry, you know what? we can have museums come to the rescue. And the reason for that was that parasitologists in general, whenever they do studies on parasites, because these organisms are rather hard to identify and sometimes their taxonomical status changes, they deposit voucher specimens in museums. And I did that in both of my studies during that time. And so we examined museum specimens of Lucilia silverum and also Lucilia elongata, rare from amphibian hosts, from three different studies in Wisconsin, one by Briggs, and then both of them from my papers that we published during my master's and my early PhD. And in fact, Terry got those flies, and this is just some pictures of the morphology that he observed. He actually dissected some of them and used his new keys to try to identify these flies based on the new records that he described in 2014. And based on the morphology, all the specimens of Lucilia silverum and Alligata specimens from North American and neurons from those three studies were now assigned to Lucilia buffonivora. And initially I was very excited, but then thinking about it, I thought, you know, something is just not right. And the reason for my hesitation was this. So the Myiasis in European amphibians has been very well studied, and the life cycles of that particular fly has been done numerous times. And this is what you see. This is some pictures I downloaded from the internet of various neurons infected with Lucilia buffonivora in Europe. And what you can see on these pictures is that most of them are toads. There's a tree frog there at the, the lower right, and also a, a true frog. All of those amphibians have maggots in their nasal passages. Now, when you do the same kind of literature search and internet search for myiasis in North American amphibians, this is what you see. You can see here a number of leopard frogs, a tree frog, and toads, and all of them that have maggot infections, they're never in the nasal passages. Yet Terry was telling me that all of these flies are the same species, Lucilia buffonivora, based on morphology. So clearly, the question became, what is going on? Well, another person, um, Gerardo, became involved, and Gerardo was actually working on his PhD on Lucilia Buffona in Europe, and he was the person who contacted Terry to try to figure out what was going on with these flies. And what Gerardo did was he sequenced partial mitochondria CO1 genes from three species of adult blowflies including Lucilia silverum and Lucilia buffonivora, collected from Europe and North America. Those are those little dots you see on the maps, and also from Lucilia elongata from North America. That's the species that's only found in North America. And once he had that, he made a molecular phylogeny. And I'm not going to go into too many details here, but the main point is that the flies we're interested in are in this clade up here at the top of that phylogeny. And if you look at that really close, there's a green and a purplish clade. And the green clade contains all the Lucilia buffonivora from Europe. 
Okay. However, the Lucilia bufonivora from North America are actually genetically distinct from the species uh, in Europe. Okay. And in fact, they're more closely related to Lucilia elongata, even though they look identical to the one in Europe. And in fact, what Corrado discovered was a process of speciation of those flies, where you notice that uh, we suspect at one time during evolutionary history, there was a fly that infected toads when the continents were together, and then when they split up, right, those flies could not fly over the, over the oceans to the continents, right, to mate, and they became, started to become distinct species, even though morphologically we can't tell them apart. And in fact, we later um, wrote a paper about this observation with Whitworth, Bolick, and, and Aris Robeldo uh, on why we think this happened. And basically, the idea was that there was continental divide, right, those flies were isolated from each other, and the types of amphibian hosts they infected were very different, and so they evolved different locations where they infect those hosts, right? And the only way we were able to figure this stuff out was by actually obtaining those museum specimens, right? Because if you remember early on, those flies Terry identified as Lucilia bufonivora in Canada were all collected as adult flies flying around. So we didn't know if they actually developed in a host, a frog or not. Well, our data from the previous studies where we misidentified these flies because we didn't know they existed in the U.S. at the time, right, were cru crucial in actually linking those observations to the specimens and some of these evolutionary history scenarios that were discovered. So moving on to story two, the creepy parasites. And here I'm going to tell you a story, is there life after parasitism, survival, longevity, and oogenesis in the house cricket infected with hairworms in the phylum Nematomorpha? So hairworms belong to a small phylum of worms with five marine and about 360 freshwater slash terrestrial species. However, estimates suggest that there may be as many as 2,000 additional undescribed species of hairworms. Again, they're parasites, they're cryptic, and people don't study these worms very often. The 360 freshwater terrestrial species are divided into 19 extinct and two extinct genera. Now, the general public is probably familiar with these to some degree because they commonly come in contact with them in puddles and lakes and ponds where you see these long thread worms, which are sometimes black or brown, sometimes white or spotted in color, that swim around on the pond bottom, right, in aquatic uh, situations. Now, the adult worms are free living, but they're interesting that they actually, as free living stages, never feed. They don't actually have a mouth, as you can see in that uh, E figure on, on that diagram right there. Now, most of these worms are about 20 to 40 centimeters in length, but sometimes they get enormous. For example, this is a female, Gordius fulgaris, which is 2.3 meters long. Now, they look thin and long, and they're called horsehair worms because they resemble hairs on horses. And at one time, people thought that horsehairs that fell into troughs became alive and were these worms before that was actually disproven. Now, in order to identify these worms, you actually have to look at their cuticle with SEM, and there's some pictures here, and they're actually quite beautiful for parasites when you actually examine them to be able to identify them. But from an insect perspective, they're kind of most famous for because as in the juvenile stage of these worms, they're parasites of terrestrial arthropods and including things like beetles in Europe, orthopterans or crickets and grasshoppers in North America, and uh, hosts like roaches and mantids in the tropics. Now, they also have a fascinating life cycle, and let me kind of go through this. We'll start off with the cricket on top of that diagram, where you can see that there's worms emerging out of that cricket. When the worms become mature, they emerge from the abdomen of the cricket into water. Here, they form these Gordian knots and start mating. Once they're done mating, they release egg strings, and then those egg strings hatch into these sessile little larvae that are on the bottom and fall to the bottom of the pond. Now, those larvae get ingested by almost any aquatic invertebrate. 
Some of those invertebrates, such as insects, will metamorphose and come out on land, and when they're eaten by crickets, those crickets become infected. Now, this is the creepy part of the uh, life cycle. So the worms develop inside of those crickets, and as they grow from this minute larva, which is about 60 microns to, you know, up to half a meter long sometimes, they absorb all the fat body of that cricket, okay, and most of its nutrients. Yet the cricket stays alive, and in fact, right before the worms are ready to emerge, they cause these little holes in the abdomen, and then as that cricket enters water, the worms begin to emerge. And in fact, this is a short little video here. If I could get it to work. Um, and basically what you're seeing here is the cricket is being placed in the water. And if you watch that long tube coming out from the back of the cricket is actually the, the ovipositor. It's a female cricket that lays eggs. But you'll notice that worms are becoming to emerge from the abdomen of that host. And they do that almost immediately when they're ready to go, as soon as that cricket enters the water. And in fact, what you're seeing, all these worms are coiling up together here, they're actually beginning to mate. Now, this life cycle is rather interesting because in a typical life cycle of a horsehair worm, the infected insect must enter water to release the free living adult worms. And in fact, when they come out on land, those worms will die and never be able to reproduce. And in fact, field observations suggest that the infected insects may deliberately enter water. Probably one of the most famous and early studies on this was by Tomas and schmidt risa where they demonstrated that the infected crickets actively jumped into a swimming pool more frequently than uninfected crickets, but in the process drowned. Now, these are some pictures from that famous video that you can probably find on YouTube. There's a cricket sitting next to the edge of a swimming pool, and then when it jumps in, that worm begins to emerge out of that cricket. Now, although exciting, what everyone remembers from that study is the following two things. Crickets die by suicide. And in fact, people have mentioned that crickets jump into water and commit suicide. And this suggests that horsehair worms are these deadly parasitoids. Okay? Parasitoids are defined that they actually kill or castrate their host, and they will never, the host will never be able to reproduce, unlike parasites, which take nutrients from the host but don't actually kill that host. Right? And that's a common dogma in horsehair worm literature. However, when you look in the old literature and some other field observation, this is what you uh, realize. Observations on infected insects from more natural habitats, such as forest streams, indicate that some infected hosts actually place their abdomen into water to release their worms, and then those insects just walk off into the forest. And in fact, there's actually some pictures you can find on the internet where you can see here there's a number of crickets and other uh, katydids that have placed their abdomen in water. Those worms are emerging out of them, and then those insects were actually observed walking off. So the question is, what is going on? Are these things actually these deadly uh, parasitoids killing their hosts, or uh, can these crickets actually survive? And right when we were reading some of this work, I had a, a PhD student, now graduated, Dr. Christina Anaya. She's at Florida Gulf Coast University in her first semester as an assistant professor, and she was really interested in horsehair worms. And Christina asked a number of questions. Number one, can crickets actually survive the infection once they release the worm? If so, for how long? And then remember those pictures I showed you that those horsehair worms absorb all the fat and other nutrients in the body cavity of those crickets. Once those worms leave, can the crickets again produce eggs? And so I'm going to show you some methods here. She did a number of experiments where she brought this life cycle into the laboratory and did experimental infections. In experiment one, she basically looked at survivorship. So on day one, she exposed the crickets to the parasites, and then she measured the cricket's length, okay? And then she kept those crickets with another experiment where she did the same thing to a group of crickets and housed them individually. 
at 25 degrees Celsius and 12 to 12 light dark cycle. And then once those worms develop to be mature and release, she placed those crickets into water. She let those worms emerge and then she placed those crickets back into containers and measured how long they lived afterwards. And then in experiment two, once those crickets started dying, she recorded when they died. And then in experiment two, she actually necropsied them and checked how many eggs they produced. While she was doing that, she also had control crickets, which she never exposed, but were timed at the same time level. So once an infected cricket released a worm, it started at day zero, right? How long they live. Same thing for a cricket that was alive that was not exposed previously. So what did Christina find? I'm going to show you a quick graph here. So this is a cumulative survivorship curve. Uh, and what you see on the x-axis is days alive post-emergence and then percent survival on the y-axis. And you got two, two lines here, a, a dotted line and a, and, and a full line, right? The dotted line is actually the infected crickets. And the non-dotted line is the control crickets. And clearly from this, you can see that those crickets that were infected died more commonly than uninfected crickets. However, after releasing their worms, on average, infected crickets survived for 73 days, but had significantly shorter lifespan by an average of about 13 days compared to the control crickets. Other results she found. We also found that the infected crickets grew significantly less during hair worm development compared to control crickets. And this makes sense. Remember, those worms absorb all those nutrients from those crickets. And as a result, right, those nutrients were going to those worms instead of the cricket. Additionally, we found that 50% of the previously infected crickets actually produced eggs after releasing their worm, right? Which clearly suggested to us, when taken together, that these observations suggest that female crickets infected with horse hair worms may experience much less mortality, right, than previously anecdotal evidence suggests. And some of these observations in the swimming pool may be that those crickets just could never actually get out of the swimming pool and drown compared to crickets uh, that actually enter streams in nature. Okay. The last story I want to tell you here is on the amazing parasites. And this is going to deal with parasite transmission in a milkweed patch and looking at parasite diversity and transmission in insects specializing on milkweed hosts. So a little bit of an introduction. Milkweeds are perennial plants consisting of over 100 species native to North America. They contain sap composed of latex and complex chemicals unpalatable to most animals. Nevertheless, milkweed serves as a host plant for a diverse assemblage of insect herbivores that utilize Asclepias species as their primarily, primary food source. So this is a common diagram you see in textbook of milkweed and the different types of insects that utilize it. Now, from our perspective, this is a little bit misleading because it deals with predominantly insects that are pollinators and they're coming to that plant to feed on nectar. What I'm going to talk about is insects that specifically develop and have part of their life cycle on these plants. And these are going to include things like seed eaters, which are some of the bugs. There's going to be the suckers, some of the aphids that feed on the sap of the leaves and spend all their life on those plants. And then there's going to be a whole slew of herbivores, number of caterpillars and beetles that specifically feed on the leaves of those plants. In addition, there are species that specialize on the stem of those milkweeds and actually feed on the stem secretions and lay their eggs and larvae in there. And then there'll be also species that specifically feed on the roots of those plants. So the part or a significant portion of the life cycle of those insects is associated with those milkweed plants. So, however, because milkweeds are perennials, right, so they senesce and then they grow every year, and only a small portion of the plant is ever consumed by its insect herbivore, the parasites of those insects should face spatial constraints on those milkweed plants. 
in your transmission from host to host. So what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. So this is a picture of a sprouting common milkweed in northern North America. And if we look close at that plant, on one of those leaves, you see a monarch butterfly egg. And so over 8 to 15 days, this is what happens. That egg hatches, and you can see that first instar caterpillar on here. It's relatively small. It's going to start feeding. Uh, it then transforms to a second instar, a third instar, a fourth instar, and a fifth instar. Right? And this is taking about 8 to 15 days or so, right? Eventually, it gets quite big, right? But you can ask where and how does that caterpillar get infected on this giant milkweed plant, right? If you're a parasite, how do you get into that host when you can't really predict where that caterpillar is going to be feeding on that entire plant? And so questions and problems from a parasite perspective how does a parasite come in contact with the host on a milkweed plant with the constraints of being small? Most of these parasites don't move very much. And not being able to predict which milkweed leaves that host will actually ingest. Most of these caterpillars never ingest as a one individual the whole entire plant. So let me give you some materials and methods of what we did. We collected insects from milkweed plants and examined them for parasites. In addition, adult butterflies and moths were obtained by either netting nectaring adults or rearing fifth instar caterpillars in the laboratory. Finally, some insects, monarchs and milkweed bugs, were reared with their parasites in the lab to confirm and complete parasite life cycles and for SEM and histological samples to be able to identify these and kind of understand how they get transmitted. So these are the insects we were able to collect that specialize on these milkweed plants. So we collected three different species of bugs. We collected five different species of beetles. And then we collected four different species of butterflies and moths. So what did we find? Of the 11 species of insects examined, five species of insects from three orders were infected with parasites. And I'm going to now tell you about those parasites and how they get transmitted. So the first insect that we found that was infected with parasites was the swamp milkweed leaf beetle. And 32% of these beetles were infected with a protopolid mite. And these are the mites. This is a male here, a, a, a picture with, with a microscope and also some drawings. And this is a female. Now, these mites, unlike some of the other parasites we've talked about so far, complete their entire life cycle on the beetle. And this is a drawing of the beetle, and I'm going to show you where different stages of these parasites are found. So when you first open up the, the hard wings of a beetle, you notice there's these yellow structures on the inner wings, and those are the eggs. So female mites always lay their eggs on a specific veins in the wings of those beetles. And you can see those blown up here a little bit. Uh, those eggs then hatch into larvae. And those larvae are actually glued on the abdomen of the beetle underneath the wings so they don't fall off. And here they feed on the sap. You can see those blown up a little bit here. Eventually, those larvae turn into adult females and adult males, which will mate. And then the females will produce more eggs. So the whole entire life cycle of that parasite is on the beetle host. Now, what about transmission of these mites in relationship to the life cycle of the swamp milkweed leaf beetle? So this is the beetle, and it arrives on a milkweed plant. And importantly, it brings its parasites with it. So these are, you can see that that beetle landed, and you can actually see the eggs on the inner wings of that particular host. That female beetle will then lay eggs on that milkweed plant. So those eggs will hatch into larvae. However, the mites never infect larvae. In fact, they always, as I mentioned, stay on the adults. So how do new beetles get them? Well, it's when they mate. When an infected beetle is mating with another beetle, what happens is the female mites will crawl down from under the wings onto the abdomen of that infected beetle, and then they'll jump hosts and move to the second beetle. And in fact, transmission in this mite is always sexual. So anytime those beetles mate, the mites will move from one host to another. So another group of insects that we found infected was the large milkweed bug and the small milkweed bug. 
And 40% of large milkweed bugs and 20% of small milkweed bugs were infected with an intestinal trypanosome mobid. So, a trypanosome related to things like sleeping sickness in human beings. And this was the critter. It was Leptomonas wallaceae, and I'm showing you some pictures of the anatomy of these parasites and also some drawings of that particular species. Now, within the gut of these insects, some interesting things happen in terms of the life cycle of this parasite. So, we mostly find the promastigote stages, the typical stage that's feeding and moving around in the middle part, the M2 part of the mid-gut of these insects. But we also find these stages in the hindgut or the rectum that are starting to form these little structures and divide. And in fact, when we look at the feces of these bugs, what you see is triple, uh, these trypanosomes that were released, but also all these little circles. Those are actually cysts that these trypanosomes produce to be able to survive outside of the host. Importantly, when we look at the eggs that the females lay, they also have these cysts on the surface of the eggs. So what about transmission of this tri uh, trypanosome added in a relationship to the life cycle of milkweed bugs? Kind of go through that real quick. So usually these bugs are migratory and they wind up on milkweed when those milkweed plants start producing milkweed pods. Males and females mate and then the females will actually lay eggs inside of those milkweed pods. Now importantly, once those bugs emerge from inside of those milkweed pods, they're already infected with these trypanosomatids. And the question is how? Well, this life cycle was actually worked out previously. And in fact, it's one of the most fascinating insect life cycles that has been done, insect parasite life cycles, in terms of the controls and the beauty that it was set up in the laboratory. Let me just quickly go through that for you. So there's really two ways these bugs get infected. When female, uh, female excuse me, bugs lay eggs inside of those milkweed plants, the eggs get contaminated with the feces from the female bug. And when they do that, those cysts of the trypanosomes get stuck on the surface of the egg. When those bugs hatch out, they need bacteria to help them uh, digest some of the, the milkweed compounds. And so they lick the surface of those eggshells they came out of, and they ingest those trypanosome cysts. And that's how they get infected. Once they get infected, bugs live in these colonies. They're relatively social. And then they do caprophagy when they commonly will feed on other feces from other bugs to get more bacteria, and they keep getting reinfected. So again, two types of transmission. There's vertical or uh, maternal transmission and horizontal. Now, the last group of uh, uh, insects that we found infected was the monarch butterfly and the queen butterfly. And both of these butterflies were infected with a neogregory, Ophyrocystis electroshrea in monarchs, and Ophyrocystis, a new species that we discovered in queen butterflies. Now, interestingly enough, this parasite is rather odd that it develops on the cuticle of butterflies. And for a long time, it was thought that as butterflies fly around, they kind of rain these spores onto milkweed plants, and that's how they get infected. And inside of those spores, there's little parasite stages that then infect caterpillars when they ingest them. Well, we realized quickly on when we were doing these life cycles that these parasites actually develop on the cuticle of butterflies. And one of the hypotheses was that they also get transmitted on the eggs of butterflies and also during sexual reproduction. So we took those infected butterflies and we started looking at their abdomen. And the eggs in a female come out of the structure that you see labeled here as egg pore. We opened up those abdomens by doing dissections. And what you notice is that the egg pore leads down into an egg chamber. And that egg chamber is lined with a cuticle. We f in fact, we put those uh, butterflies under a scanning electron microscope, and when we blew that egg chamber up and looked inside, what we saw was hundreds of these oocysts developed inside of that egg chamber. We then brought infected butterflies into the lab, and we watched them lay eggs. And this is going to be the business end of a female I'm showing you here. So this is the egg pore. The structure is going to be opening up as the female begins to lay an egg. The egg begins to emerge, as you can see here. It's being held by these two little calipers on the sides of the ovipositor. But 
when we start looking at this, what we notice is that there was this clear membrane that held that egg. You can see an E and F and also in C. Well, as that egg is extruded, that whole membrane comes out. It's basically like rolling off your sock when you're getting undressed at night. And when we looked at the surface of that unrolled ovipositor, it was covered with these parasites. And so what we realized is, when a butterfly lays an egg, this is the egg, those parasites are touching the surface and are left behind. And in fact, when you put those eggs under a scanning electron micrograph, you can start looking at them and clearly you, when you look at it initially, you don't see any parasites. But when you start looking closely, sure enough, that's where the oocysts are. And once that caterpillar hatches, they always go back and the first meal they have is they ingest their egg shell and that's how they become infected. Now, we also looked at male butterflies. Once we knew that these parasites developed on the cuticle, and we looked at the dagus, so this is kind of like the penis of, of insects that they use to mate in a male. And what we did is we just looked inside of that adagus to see if there was any parasites. And sure enough, if you look in there, this is just three little sections under a microscope, you can see all of those oocysts. We took those butterflies and we let them mate. So infected males here are mating with um, infected females. And once they start copulating, monarchs will mate for anywhere from two to up to 15 hours, where the male deposits this complex spermatophore structure, which has sperm and also feeding material for the female. We took those females, we dissected the copulatory bursa, the structure that holds uh, the sperm, and leads to the vagina where the eggs are. And we looked inside of there, and sure enough, there was lots of these parasites that were transferred from the adagus. And in fact, we looked in these ductus seminalis, this little tube that leads to where the eggs are stored, and sure enough, there was those parasites inside there. As a result, we realized that when those butterflies mate, it looks like they transmit the parasites and can potentially contaminate the eggs in uninfected females. So how do these parasites get transmitted in relationship to the monarch butterfly life cycles? Well, again, like we mentioned, the female lays eggs, and there's this vertical maternal transmission, very similar to those um, bugs that we talked about with the trypanosomes. There's also horizontal transmission. Some of the spores get left behind on uh, the milkweed leaves, and then the caterpillars ingest them. And now we've been able to show that there's also sexual transmission. So in conclusion, then, the transmission strategies of four species of parasites found during this study all shared either maternal transmission or sexual transmission, even though those parasites and those hosts had very different evolutionary histories. Our study suggests that the spatial constraints of living on milkweed plants have selected for similar transmission strategies in unrelated species of parasites infecting unrelated species of insect hosts. So in general, I hope all of you now have a better appreciation of the dreadful, creepy, and amazing lives of insect parasites and parasites of insects. Number of people I would like to acknowledge, uh, I'm just going to show this slide here, not take too much time, but number of collaborators, Chen Ho Li for inviting me to give this presentation, also museum curators that provided some of the parasites we work with. Finally, my students at OSU that do a lot of this work in our lab and help me uh, work on parasites of insects, and I will be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bolick, for the amazing presentation, and now we will take questions. For our very first question, Billy Laggard asked Dr. Bolick, have you noticed any additional behavior changes in crickets infected with hairworms besides the need to enter water when it is time for the hairworm to be released? You know, we have, uh, you know, we don't study the behavior that much in crickets. So um, other than them actually entering water, no, we have not actually, you know, observed any kind of behavior. Sometimes in, in wild hosts, um, um, when you bring them into the lab and when you get lucky and you actually collect an infected one, sometimes they, you know, they act erratic and so forth, but that's usually the only kind of behaviors we see, you know, but, but most of the things we do in horse is work on the life cycle.
ethical and you know they affect crickets but we don't do very much on behavior at least not yet that's one of the next things we're going to be uh, exploring thank you for the next question sarah bush asked Dr. Bollock, do you think epigenetics factor may explain the different microhabitat preference of the toad flies? Uh, that, I saw that, Sarah, and that's a great question. Um, I don't think so. So what Sarah is talking about epigenetic factors, that there is some sort of, you know, um, cues that those you know adult flies get and then that's transferred to the offspring that they do some kind of differences I, you know we don't know the whole specificity of these flies very well because not very many reports in north america of frogs i think there's maybe 10 reports of infections um, that people have actually documented 10 different studies in europe you know uh, they've mostly been recorded from um, toads, and a, a specifically one species of toad, Bufo Bufo, uh, but they do infect other species of, of, of frogs, tree frogs sometimes, and they're always in the nasal passages, you know, and uh, even they don't infect salamanders very commonly, but when they do, they do the same behavior. Um, now, one of the things we thought early on and you know we have no data for this but the, maybe some of those toads have different feeding behavior so the american toads are actually distantly related to the european toads and when you try to do these infections in the lab at least in, in previous papers usually what happens is the toads will eat the flies in a cage and so people Early on, when they did these studies, they would actually sew the mouths of toads so they couldn't eat the flies to get them to infect the lab. And so in nature, those flies have to be kind of sneaky when they show up. Um, and I suspect, although I don't know, that potentially the way toads in North America and in Europe feed on flies and kind of interact with them may be different. And that's why those, those behaviors uh, occurred that way. But yeah. It's a great question, but I don't know. I, my gut feeling is probably no, but you never know. Thanks. Okay, so the next question, are there differences in the infection of female versus male infections by the metamorphs? Yeah, great question. Um, we don't really have data on that. Now, the reason we don't have any data on that is when you actually go out and sample arthropods in nature to find infected ones, of course, you know, you can sample a couple thousand crickets and maybe two or three individuals are infected. So the prevalence of actually finding infected hosts of a particular species is extremely low in nature. And so, you know, usually you get, you know, two or three individuals, and sometimes they're all male, sometimes they're all female. Uh, when we do infections in the lab, we usually use female crickets because they're a little bit tougher and they live longer. So sometimes when, when we infect these hosts in the lab, it's difficult to say, I'm going to give that cricket exactly 10 larvae. So we give them a combination, and some of them eat 10, some of them eat more, some of them eat less. And when you do that with male and crickets, usually male crickets don't live as long anyways. Uh, but when they get infected, they don't live there as long either, and so they die commonly. So it's easier to maintain the life cycle on female crickets. So we usually use female crickets in the lab. Uh, you would suspect, though, based on your question, in that in nature, because usually female insects will eat more to, to, to produce eggs compared to males, not always, but, but you know, kind of the general dogma, you would suspect that female insects would be more commonly infected, right? Because they're just eating more. The first of them larvae are in the body, so they would have a higher probability of getting infected. That, you know, that's all I could probably say to that question. Thank you. For our next question, it's still from Dying Burton. We ask Dr. Bollock, why do you think that these flies are not common in tropic uh, in tropical amphibians? Ah, 
Yeah, it's a good question. So in, you know, in South America, there's a different, so th these flies belong to the Californids or blowflies. That's the family. Now in, in South America, there are flies that also cause myiasis in amphibians, that are usually flesh flies, sarcophagids. And in Australia, right, Diane, you probably know this very well, and you may actually have a head of paper on it, I think. Um, right, there's the gra gra grass flies, uh, which actually have this special relationship where they burrow under the skin of frogs. But in terms of why Lucilia, uh, you know, I don't know. And I don't, you know, I'm not a, a other than the weird parasites that infect amphibians, I'm not a blowfly specialist, so I couldn't tell you that, but I, I can definitely ask Terry if he has any ideas. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not found, you know, Lucilia species infecting amphibians are only really um, at whole Arctic. And they're not found in, in South America or the tropics or, or, you know, places like Australia. And there's different, you know, families of flies that, that specialize on frogs in those areas. Thank you. And for our next question, we have Mickey N asked, do adult amphibians consume adult Lucilia? If so, do you think the misfortune of one host dying by infection is a boon for an uninfected host? That's a great question. And in fact, we just I just wrote a little purple paper of some folks who found some of these maps. In, um, in Canada um, in, in a toad, but they didn't keep the maggots, but we wanted to put out a little note in herp review. So when herpetologists see these flies, they, they collect them so we can actually identify them to know what species are infecting amphibians in America. But your question is a good one because out of the 12 or so reports of myiasis in North America, Almost all of them were due to Lucilia silverum at the time and Lucilia elongata. But there was a couple other Lucilia sometimes. And one of those was a Lucilia species that was a saprophagic, so it fed as a maggot on carrion. But what these folks had tree frogs in the lab, and they collected some of these blowflies that were sitting on the window and they fed them to the frog. And one of those flies must have had a, a fertilized is because when the frog ate the fly, the next day the fly eggs hatched in the stomach and consumed the frog from inside. So yes, when flies, and, and you know, one of the ideas we have in terms of that difference, if they're found in the nasal passages in Europe and they're not found in, in nasal passages in North America, maybe because they frogs actually hunted and or toads, ate those flies and they had to figure out ways to avoid getting eaten, right? And they did these special migrations. Obviously, we have to come up with some clever experiments, you know, and some kind of phylogenetic evolutionary things to be able to test that um, and find variation. But yeah, that's a beautiful question. Thank you, Dr. Bolick. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we can ask another, like one last question. So I have a question from Mickey. Are there any immune response when hosts are infected by horse hairworms? Yeah, it's a great question. No one I don't has done that work, although my uh, good friend and collaborator, Ben Hinnell, has been doing some work on uh, horse hairworms so, and immunity. One of the things we see when crickets are infected with horse hairworms is that they actually live longer than uninfected crickets. And the interesting thing is that the common dogma is that the fat body of the cricket is kind of the major immune system of that host. And the interesting thing is that when that horse hairworm develops inside of the cricket, it absorbs almost the entire fat body, or at least when you dissect them, you can't see it, right? And so the question comes about is how in the heck do those crickets survive, right? It seems like their immune system has been taken away. And before the, the worms actually emerge out of that cricket, right? Because they don't know when the cricket is going to get into water. They make a little hole in the abdomen and they stick their head out and they kind of sample the environment and then they go back in, right? And so you can imagine every time they stick their head out and they touch the ground, they get bacteria on them, 
and then they pull those bacteria inside of the body cavity of that cricket. But the cricket does just fine, right? And so what Ben did was he started wondering if maybe the horse hair worm, the immune system that protects the cricket, and he injected them with some bacteria, the horse hair worms, when he pulled them out and then looked at mRNA expression and see if they were producing any kind of immune proteins that are found in invertebrates. And sure enough, they do. And when a cricket is infected, we think, well, we don't have any real good data on this, that the immune system actually gets shut down uh, of the cricket, but the horse hair worm expresses its own immune system pr to protect its home, right? At least until it can get out. So yeah, great question. Thank you, Dr. Metabolic, again for the great presentation and all the answers. In Thanks. the interest of time, this is the end of this session with parasite and host animals with six legs. And our next section, parasite and host animals with things from Dr. Kevin Lafferty and Dr. Chelsea Wood will start at 8 p.m. Mountain Time, which is in three minutes. So let's take a short three minutes break and see you in next session. Thank you.